Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome. It's a rainy day, but it's a beautiful day. We're in a beautiful room for a beautiful occasion. I'm so glad to see smiling faces, happy faces. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mary Bemis, and I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Organic Spa Magazine, as well as the chair of this lovely symposium. On behalf of my fellow board members, I thank you all very, very much for coming. It means the world to each of us. This is the inaugural symposium of the newly formed Washington Spa Alliance. Our goal is to leverage the strength of the spa industry and to make a more lasting contribution to the well-being of our nation. I've long preached that spas have a responsibility to educate the consumer to a better, healthier lifestyle. Now the time has come for spas to take themselves more seriously, to realize that we can actually make a profound difference in the health and well-being of our society, and indeed we are making a huge difference. The Washington Spa Alliance believes that the Greater Spas Industry's pioneering efforts encompass a unique interdisciplinary approach to fitness, travel, alternative and preventive medicine, and a connection to nature, as well as sustainable practices ranging from economic to agriculture. Today you will hear from some of the pioneers in these fields who will discuss how spas can broaden their mission of promoting health and fitness and who will describe their vision. To give you a simple overview of the day, we will hear commentary from the legendary Deborah Zeke and the ever-dynamic Philippe Bourguignon, followed by three panels. After each session, there will be a Q&A period, and I encourage each of you to engage in the conversation and to help redefine the American spa experience. Special thanks go out to our sponsors, Precor and Universal, to Guy Yonkman for his generosity in donating advertising in his magazine, and to our tote bag donators. I'd also like to have the board stand at this time so all of you can just get a face, a, put a face to us. So if any of you have any questions, you need any help throughout the day, please don't, don't, hesitate, to, don't hesitate to call on us. Uh, right now, I would like to turn this over to the co-chairs, Mr. Bernard Burt, Ms. Sherilyn Abajay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and being on deck uh, so bright and early. Uh, we have a full program, so I'm going to keep my remarks very brief. But Charlotte and Abijay, uh, many of you know, as uh, previously with Red Door and uh, then recently with Marriott as Global Director of Spa Development. And with her help and with this board of directors, in less than a year, we put this together. I, I think it's unprecedented. I know uh, I've been to every iSpa conference since it, 20 years ago, and nothing, no program like this has ever happened. So that's what makes Washington Spa Alliance different, and today you're going to experience it. Thank you, Bernie. Good morning, everyone. Well. I, I won't say, I won't uh, make long speeches, but we do have a um, most amazing um, curriculum set up for today, and um, we are among friends, as I was talking to Muffin and I, and I appreciate everyone that has contributed and um, actually shown up. So this is a great sign, and it's the strength of the community and the network, and we are um, experiencing a new reality in, in our industry, and it's exciting, and grab hold of the opportunity. Wellness is on the horizon, fitness, health, um, eating better, touching the youth of our uh, global society, and educating them so it will, um, actually in the next 10, 15 years, it will truly be a, a different world. So enjoy the day. Thank you very much. Twenty-one years ago, I had breakfast in Georgetown at the home of Deborah Seke, and we talked about the need for a professional organization in the spa industry. And there was none, and so we created it. We started it and launched iSpa from Deborah's Georgetown kitchen. And 
Uh, she vol volunteered to come to the first ISPOC conference as the keynote speaker, and to have her here today is a great, great pleasure. I think you all know her bio. It's in the, your program, some of it. Her, her and continuing uh, involvement in Washington affairs uh, uh, is very impressive, and she actually was recruited by the Reagan White House for a, a, an assignment in it with an Inter-American Foundation. And uh, from those experiences, we, we all are um, indebted to her and uh, for coming from San Diego to be with us today for this first symposium. I, we owe a, a deep th bow and thanks to Deborah Seke. I'm very glad that um, Bernie didn't introduce me as the godmother because I said it made me feel like the grandmother. <laughs> and I am the grandmother in many ways. I'm very proud of all of you. So, um, this is a very important occasion and we really are very happy to have you all here. And I do have a written speech. And let me just, does that work okay? Because I don't want to look at it straight. I barely, barely want to look at my speech. Welcome. It is a perfect time of year for us to gather here in Washington, D.C. for two reasons. One you'll see, it's beautiful. The other we all know is grievously sad. As the cherry blossoms along the mall burst into bloom, but soon drift gently silently to the ground, we are reminded of Sakura, the season in Japan, when everyone contemplates what is beautiful and vulnerable at the same time. Life is so precious, immediate, and full of joy. Life is also so fleeting. For us in this room, our precious lives hold the promise of the future and synchronicity, which I will discuss in a moment. For our friends on the northern coast of Japan, the preciousness of so many lives lost rips the very fabric of their society. And tears at our hearts here. Delicate cherry blossoms remind us how fragile life is and how we must make the most of it. Spring and cherry blossoms have not arrived there yet, as they have here, but they will again, if not this year. Soon, they will. Let me share one haiku by Isa as we pause for a moment and send them our prayers. Live in simple faith, just as this simple cherry flower fades and falls. And now to synchronicity, our raison d'etre today. Synchronicity can be the Washington Spa Alliance manifesto of possibility. And I hope you agree, probability. It is not by chance that we are here today. It was, I believe, probable. Carl Jung defined synchronicity as a meaningful coincidence of two or more events where something other than the probability of chance is involved. As I first began to put my thoughts to paper for today, I was drawn to the bookshelf in my home in San Diego, guided by hidden hands. I pulled down the work by George Jaworski entitled Synchronicity, The Inner Path of Leadership. I've marked the page edges of this book over the years with so many colored tabs that my copy looks like a rainbow. It's a book I recommend to you. All of you here are leaders. You call yourself managers, entrepreneurs, CEOs, founders, or what have you. But we are leaders, fundamentally leaders. The act of being in this room indicates our dedication to being leaders, for we are the ones who desire change, and know to some degree how to make it happen. All of us have had some success individually, both personally and with our life's work. Now I believe we are ready for alignment on a deeper level. Jaworski describes this alignment as what happens when people in a group begin to function as a whole. There's an analogy to jazz. Everyone here today has been out in the world 
playing saxophones and trumpets and basses and drums and clarinets. Now the time has come for us to make real music. We'll know it when we fuse as a whole, when we feel that we're in the moment in the groove. Most important, it will happen when we begin to shift our fundamental way of thinking. Jaworski calls it a shift from seeing a world made up of things to seeing a world that's open and made up of relationships. I bring this up today because I believe we're a group of individuals who have already taken the first steps towards this understanding of how important relationships are to family, to health, to our customers, and to our nation. We have chosen an industry, I hate that word, but it's often used to define the business of spa that exists to serve, an industry that exists to serve. To serve is to open yourself and your team of coworkers and co-visionaries, such as all of us in this room, to the need for relationships. We love human beings, not things. We long for peace and prosperity in ways that have nothing to do with cars, iPads, phones, big screen television, or the control of others through non-democratic regulations and rules. We long for the freedom of health, good health for all, health chosen first by every individual as his or her right to a long, active life, rather than life in a world of sickness defined by surgeons, pharmaceutical companies, and governments. We have opened our mind to the possibilities of health for all through our work in SPA, which is the very essence of renewing, recharging, and recalibrating lives. This gives our work and our lives the meaning we all seek. When we run into others like us who want to explore consciousness and thoughts and ideas, it can be pure synchronicity. Isn't it great to be in the spa business? Because this happens on many levels all the time. We're used to it, but never jaded to what a gift our work bestows upon us. Today, you will meet and listen to others who are like you, but may also be very different, just as a saxophone is completely unlike a set of drums, but what beautiful music they can make together. I am my own instrument. I have my own ideas of what a Washington Spa Alliance can do to be relevant. My preference is to see us focus on the whole body, the synchronicity of how a universe of cells operates together to grow and maintain health. This focus can begin with our children. What better place to start? Currently, we are in the midst of a food renaissance, the way it is grown, harvested, transported, prepared, and ultimately a renaissance in the way we look at how our bodies use it and what food of dubious quality does to our bodies. My friends Alice Waters of Chez Panisse in Berkeley and Nora Pouillon of Restaurant Nora in this city, I'm so pleased she will be here today, have revolutionized the way farm to table have moved into what I would call a very strong side stream. Monoculture factory farm agriculture is being threatened by a varietal and organic, thank goodness. It's not the nation's mainstream yet, but thanks to Nora's and Alice's concern about food freshness and vitality and slowness, as well as their interest in the health of children, the revolution is underway. What food leaders like Nora and Alice have done for food, we as wellness leaders can do for obesity. America's children, 17% of whom are already obese, and facing a lifetime of medical trouble, must learn how the body works at an early age. I believe we can start by creating an innovative new elementary school program in which children learn about their own body's physical and nutritional needs and the living skills needed to secure a healthful new lifestyle. It's not enough to mandate what they eat at school. They must know why the body thrives when properly cared for and what this can mean to their entire lives. It's sad, but true. There is not one word in the media of the role spas have played in preventing hundreds of thousands of people from joining the ranks of the obese. Our industry should be celebrated 
and looked at as a model of what can be done. I would like to see SPA, everyone connected with SPA, fitness, beauty, all aspects of our industry try to get away from our image of the spa car wash. A place where you come in with your shine worn off and exit buffed. We know how the body works, and now we spas have an opportunity and an obligation to get the nation on board. Start with your staff. Send them to classes that delve deep into healthy living. Educate them. They will soon realize that it is so much better to prevent than to have to heal through radical conventional means. Let's not wait until customers are sick. The hospitals have that business. We are in a position to keep people out of the healthcare, sick care end game. Models that are proven so costly and debilitating. Another great thing about working with children if they can learn the skills of healthy living, they will lead their parents to healthier habits as well. I've already created a model curriculum working with the University of San Diego called the Living Skills Semester that is used for the fifth grade. And I'm looking soon to secure funds and launch it in San Diego and beyond. I also believe that the Washington Spa Alliance must be a real force amongst our, lawless, our lawmakers. As a lobby group, the Washington Spa Alliance can focus on the legislatures and the judicial branch of NSA. For example, we can influence decisions on our behalf that affect therapists of all kinds, especially those specializing in massage and Feldenkrais, craniosacral, aromatherapy, hydrotherapy. The list is extensive. We take our right to provide these services somewhat for granted. Wouldn't we sleep easier knowing that our professionalism was unimpeded by a raft of new regulations and licensing requirements? The chasm between traditional medical service, the sickness model, and the prevention modalities of SPA is narrowing. But there will always be those who want us marginalized, contained, restricted. As a lobby group, will stay on top of these. My other cause at the moment, oh, the moment has lasted 71 of almost 89 years, is a book I'm writing called Watch Yourself Grow Younger. It began when I fell in Galveston, New Mexico, about two years ago, and broke three ribs. I was immobilized for a month, lived and slept in an electric chair, and I watched in horror as I grew older. It was a glimpse into the future, a future that I, even in my mid-80s, wanted no part of. So I hired a retired Navy SEAL to come to my house regularly and train me. I quit skipping Pilates and my walks, and I really practiced what I preached. And today I can truly see that I am watching myself grow younger. Believe me, it's fun. Give this same gift to yourselves now, if you haven't already. And give it to your staff, your customers, and the world that waits. It's so empowering. These are my banners. What are yours? More importantly, what will ours be? Will we continue to be at the forefront of taking this movement to everyone who will listen? I know we will be. I'm totally open to the possibility and the probability that I can and will explore new ideas many times as I begin to listen to you. We will play our instruments together today. I'm excited about our speakers and the chance to talk with all of you during breaks. I want to learn. There's so much learning in life. Let's make this day a day of unfolding, of love of what we do, of love of what we can be, that synchronicity. That's also the Washington Spa Alliance. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Once again, you've challenged us, you've inspired us, and uh, set the right tone for this day. And uh, I can 
tell you uh, that we are going to follow your advice for the first time on Capitol Hill in May. The spa industry will be represented at a congressional reception so, uh, sponsored by the Professional Beauty Association. Uh, members of W Spa will be doing treatments for the members uh, of the Congress who come there, and uh, we hope this will be an annual event. But it was one of those things that developed because W Spa existed, and uh, I happened to be in Honolulu with Dee Yonkman in January for a marketplace event and met one of the board members of the Professional Beauty Association, and that's, that's how we are growing. Well, uh, I'm uh, uh, given the honor of introducing our keynote speaker this morning, and uh, I'll keep it sh short because you have his biography in, in the program notes. Uh, but Philippe, Philippe Bourguignon came to Washington from Paris about five years ago, just like Lafayette, to start a revolution. And since then, he has been all across America uh, focusing on the American spa experience and looking at it with new eyes because of his many years in the European hotel industry and having chaired the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, uh, where he hosted many leaders of business, industry, and politics, where he met Steve Case and was uh, enticed to come to Washington. And now, uh, I think Philippe has learned the, wa the ways of Washington. Uh, he, he bikes uh, from his apartment in town to his office near DuPont Circle. And uh, he enjoys uh, the scene in Washington, as well as at Miraval, where he now has a house. And he's working on some very exciting new projects, which I can't reveal today. But we do have Philippe, and it's saving you a trip to Istanbul, because he, he is bringing us his update on the keynote speech he gave at the Global Spa Symposium, uh, Summit, Global Spa Summit last year in Istanbul. Philippe was the keynoter, and I'm happy to present him to you today. Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you very much, Bernie, for not only inviting me to participate to uh, uh, the sessions today, uh, but giving me the privilege to address this audience now. Uh, it reminds me of um, a time when I was the CEO of Euro Disney, where one day I had to address, we invited 300 teachers, French teachers, uh, to explain to them that uh, Disney was a very good cultural product. And uh, if you remember, in France at the time, Euro know, Disney was uh, not seen as a very French cultural product. So I prepared a very uh, good speech, and I was uh, a little shy. I addressed them. Uh, fortunately, they enjoyed Disney that whole day. It was at the end of the day. And uh, what I did not expect is that they applauded me at the end. So I said, well, after the formal speech now, let me tell you exactly what I really think personally. And I started again. So today it's about the same. Uh, I have only one speech. I will not do two. Uh, but I'm very impressed by uh, this audience and uh, the fact that here you have uh, all of the people who actually created this industry in the US uh, way, way back. And uh, myself, I'm very modest because I'm a newcomer to this industry. Um, also, you may wonder why you, you, from my name and my accent, you can probably uh, see that I'm French. <laughs> and and uh, uh, by the way, I didn't start revolution. Steve Case did. I'm helping him to, to uh, grow it and, uh, and, and make it, uh, and make it a, good, uh, a good organization. So anyway, uh, being from a foreign country uh, creates perspective because you, uh, you, you are looking at this country, uh, even though I've been, uh, all together I've been living uh, in the US on three occasions, seven years in New York, years ago, when my two children were grown up now, 
uh, were born. I lived then in uh, Los Angeles for uh, four years and I've been in uh, Washington for five years. But even though I, I think I now know and understand this country relatively well, you always have a different perspective uh, being, from, uh, being from abroad. And this is what we're going to try to do. I'm, I'm trying to give some perspective to what the spa industry and the growing trend of wellness uh, are. Uh, so we're going to start, I would say, very high in altitude on uh, very, very global uh, trends. And then we'll, uh, we'll land and be uh, more, more pragmatic and more uh, detailed and specific on why the spa industry is playing a key role in the development of wellness and preventive medicine today. So um, the other thing I, I wanted to mention is that uh, when I do my first job, my father told me, you don't care what the job is, you take the highest paid job because this pay will follow you for the rest of your life because they increase you 10% from there, 15. So the, the, the start is very important. Well, I did not follow his advice. <laughs> and, and I took a very poorly paid job, which allowed me to travel, because my dream was to travel and travel the entire world. And this is what I've been doing for 40 years now, a little more than 40 years. I see a lot of young people in this room, so they say, this guy is a dinosaur. But uh, <laughs> even though, you know, I think 40 years is not, is not, uh, is not uh, very long ago. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what happened in the last 40 years because it helps understanding what's going to happen and how fast the next 40 years are going to move. So 40 years ago, uh, the world was very different. When I started working, uh, there was no fax machine, there was no unleaded fuel, there was no soft drink cans, there was no barcodes, uh, there was no email, no digital pictures, no DHL, no GSM, uh, no Microsoft, no eBay, no Google, and certainly no Facebook and no Twitter. <laughs> and this is not long ago. Um, and uh, there was not lead certified buildings, right? and life expectancy was about seven years shorter than it is today in just 40 years. So imagine what the next 40 years could be if it moves that fast and is going to continue to move fast. So what are now a few important facts? What I'm going to, it's not, this is not uh, imagination, whatever, it's pure facts. Uh, there are a few important facts uh, about the future. First, we are entering the age of women. Now each time I say that, women are, <laughs> there are a lot of women here. I don't do it to be nice to you, but the fact is that we are witnessing the feminization of society and of human activity. This is what in Europe we call Eve Olution. Eve -olution. <laughs> the age of singles. If you look around you, you will be surprised to see how many single households you have. And uh, it's roughly, in the Western world, in its cities, it's roughly 50% of the population which one way or another live by themselves. So half of the population, uh, I'm, I'm taking out teenagers obviously, right? for one reason or another live by themselves. That's an important fact. The age of cities. We were, centuries ago, it was the age of cities. Remember Venice and the influence of Venice uh, in the world trade, or Genoa. Today, Shanghai, Mumbai. And one city which uh, was in the news recently, and that's a very interesting example, Cairo. The first time I went to Cairo was in 1973, a few weeks after the war ended with Israel. The, the, the cars still had the, 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 the blue paint on their, on their, on their lights. 1973, Cairo had 5.7 million inhabitants. Today, 19 million. 19 million, this is the population of New York State, which is the third most populated state in the US, after California and Texas. 
These are significant facts. Last year, half of the world population was living in cities for the first time in humanity. 20 years from now, 60% of the world population will live in cities. So that's billions of people. It's huge. Moving in cities. The age of knowledge. Knowledge is very key. And this is one of the things which the United States understand very well. This is why Americans are so innovative. Uh, why America uh, is also uh, so different in a number of ways, but this is one of them. America attracts the best talents from the planet. <coughs> Russians, Chinese, Indians, even French, Spanish, <laughs> from anywhere in the world. Talent flocks in the US. Very interesting to see, you know, eBay board, twice a year we had what we called a technology update. And we had an update for about 20 people who actually were doing like mobile, new mobile applications, new technology applications, and so on. You enter the room, and they were not two of the same nationality. They were from everywhere on the planet. And this will trend to one thing called cultural hybridization, which we'll come back a little later. The age of cheap. I don't mean that negatively. Uh, I, I wrote a book uh, some time back, and I explained, and that's the best possible explanation, that uh, 20 years ago, the price of a car was about twice as much by pound than the price of tomatoes. Today, it's exactly the opposite. And cars are much better today than they were 20 years ago. They are safer and the other. Okay? So, uh, cheap. We produce things cheaply, and we are entering an age where people are more interested in no frills, low cost, real value, versus you know, things which are expensive, and doesn't mean lack of quality. Age of noise. Noise is everywhere, I and mean, you know that iPod, which by the way I like, so I'm not criticizing. Uh, iPod, mobile phone, car, voice, music. The relentless cacophony of urban living takes its toll. Think <coughs> silence. That's one of the things, by the way, I've learned at Mirabel. Silence, silence, and the value of silence. The art of escapology is going to become the art of survival. And last, the age of, or before last, the age of prevention. Healthcare system, uh, you all know that, are on the verge of collapse. That's not in the US, it's basically everywhere in the Western world. We need lifestyle strategies uh, which are very, very different from the future, future. and today, uh, obviously, there will be a lot of discussion around this subject. The future is nothing less than the creation of a new culture of health. And last, the age of age. Obviously, population is aging, but in better shape. And uh, very interesting what uh, Deborah uh, said, uh, said about you. Uh, but in, in general terms, uh, beyond your personal case and, and, and how well you handle it, life expectancy is today, in the US, 77.9 years. 81.1 in France, by the way. A little better. <laughs> Um, because we work less. <laughs> but anyway, um, and, and again, it uh, grew seven years in the last uh, 40 years, and it's going to probably grow another seven years in the next uh, 40 years. So that's what I call the age of age. So these were the facts. Undisputable. Uh, now, what are the consequences? Th these are more opinions. We're not at the beginning of a new millennium, but we are uh, on the threshold of a new civilization. Uh, today, we are entering the age of uh, interactive television. Uh, we don't know yet exactly how far it's going to take us, but it's going to take us very far. Uh, obviously, robots. Uh, you have robots uh, everywhere. I uh, was uh, 
reading a document, a friend of mine who uh, is the CEO of a robot company in south of France, uh, there is this uh, convention, uh, which I didn't know about, about robotics and robots. And uh, they have robots for everything. Uh, so the last presentation was a robot like washing uh, windows. You, you put a robot in. So they have a robot. And the CCTs, uh, why not? Uh, uh, solar powered uh, electrical cars. Uh, that's for tomorrow. Uh, not, not tomorrow morning, but very soon. So this is obviously uh, going to change a number of things. At the same time, again, if I make my 40 years parallel, 40 years ago, 40 years from now, in 2050, the world population would have grown by 2 billion people. 2 billion. Most of those 2 billion are going to come from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And this is the most formidable challenge that uh, the humanity is going to face uh, for another reason. Uh, food availability first. Water. Uh, obviously climate. And last, very important, immigration, uh, obviously, which you see uh, again everywhere. A new intellect. Uh, with the change of millennium, uh, we moved from the Gutenberg millennium to the digital uh, time. And in doing so, uh, it's a different side of the brain which is working. Uh, Gutenberg Millennium was the left-hand side of the brain, which is all about logic and reason. The other side of the brain uh, is more about paradox, freedom, and intuition. Next evolution is the consumer society, which has been my generation, uh, is moving toward an information society. Uh, our mass society is moving toward a society of individuals. We'll come back to that later. And our standardized society is moving toward the hybrid society, uh, which uh, I alluded to a little bit earlier. Last uh, piece of evolution, too many crises, uh, too much stress, uh, too much passion, too many doubts, too much food, too much sugar, too much greed, too much everything, will ultimately give us back to ourselves. And from an age of excess of passion, we're going to enter, I think, into a period of moral reason. Uh, excess starts to be seen as an issue. Not yet completely, but it starts. And uh, we are anticipating the end of a long period of what was called irrational exuberance. So with those facts and those evolutions, uh, obviously, uh, they will all conduct to a number of behavioral changes. And I'm, I'm not, my speech would be way too long to do it, so I've selected a few which, at revolution, we think are important for our businesses. So it's just a selection. It's obviously not an exhaustive list of all behavioral changes you're going to see in the next few years. First one, jobs are the new assets. This is a fundamental change in the US. By the way, I would like to, uh, I don't want to, I, I could do a parallel between Europe and the US, that's subject by itself, but one fundamental difference between Europe and the US, which not so many people understand, is that the US has been traumatized by the 1929 crisis, crisis and the loss of jobs. So the US always does whatever it can to create jobs. Europe had been traumatized by inflation, which led to the Republic of Weimar in Germany and to Nazis. So Europe is fighting inflation even against job creation. And this will always be the fundamental difference between the two countries. But we're seeing that, for different reasons, jobs are becoming more important in the US than they have ever been. And clearly, today, it is more important to have a job than to own a home or to own stock. And that's going to change the relationship Americans have vis-a-vis -vis ownership. And we think that when you use things only part-time, it's a huge window open to what we call sharing. Sharing houses for vacation. 
sharing cars. I'm not going to advertise for Zipcar, but <laughs> there it is. So sharing is going to be an evolution, and relationship ownerships is going to change. Consumers are dropping out altogether from buying non-necessities. And this is the result of the last crisis, but it was underlying a little before. Value versus frugality. So, uh, two or three examples. Why pay an expensive one ounce facial cream because it is in a beautiful crystal little flacon, which makes tons of margin for the maker of the cream. And instead of having one ounce, won't you prefer to have three ounces in a slightly less elegant little flacon? Why have huge flower arrangements in hotel lobbies, which are very expensive, <coughs> and at the same time be charged 20 bucks for your Wi-Fi in your room? Why rent a car in a conventional rental car organization where you have only three places in a city where you can pick the car up and where you can rent the car for only 24 hours, when you can rent it by the hour at the corner of the street? So these are changes. People are becoming more frugal and more conven convenience-oriented. They want to pay for what they have, or you want to pay for what you have decided has value for you, not what a marketer has decided has value for you. <coughs> and that's another big change. A new luxury. Luxury is becoming more personal and uh, authentic and less formulaic. I keep saying the example in France, uh, the fact that uh, today um, people used to trust the Michelin Guide. And a uh, Michelin Guide, to have a star for a restaurant, you need to follow certain criteria. And today, frankly, client or guest don't give a damn uh, on the fact that you have white gloves for service and the metro deal, whatever it's obliged. And what's very interesting, mm -hmm. Over the last five years, every year, you have two or three French chefs who drop their stars at the Michelin Guide just to become more natural and authentic. That's the evolution of luxury. Um, I could go on and on on this one, so I'll, I'll stop because maybe too long. But <laughs> so, um, today, also, uh, when you go on vacation or when you go to a restaurant, more uh, and more people want the luxury of a great tasting meal prepared with uh, organic food, uh, according to an authentic uh, local or regional recipe. And uh, also learn a few tips on how to do it when you go back home. And this is what we're going to have at lunch with Chef Shad, who is uh, there, who uh, is our chef at Miraval. And, and, uh, and this is, again, uh, this is the new definition of luxury. Ease of access. Today, Everything is accessible the way you want, when you want. And only a few people don't understand it. I had a big fight in France with the French movie industry because once I said that today it's up to the consumer to decide if he wants to watch a movie on his, on his iPad, on his television, or in, or in a theater. The time where you impose quotas and the movie has to go in theaters for before, uh, one year before it can be released on DVD and six months before it can be elsewhere and so on, that's gone. And they are trying to hang on to through legislation and conservative legislation to things which are object of the past. Today, people want things, when they want them, how they want them. That's ease of access. Authenticity. People today prefer no frill things which are authentic. The, the bling bling luxury is going out. Um, uh, my friend Bernard Arnaud, who owns Vuitton, doesn't like when I say that, but I'm convinced that, well, by the way, if they didn't have China as their prime market, there would be a, there would be a suffering. So people today look at more at authentic experiences, which are meaningful, unique, and uh, very intimate. Today, some I say that, uh, people having fun, but I'm saying that very seriously. Uh, people are tired of too much perfection and too much excellence. And they claim the right to imperfection. The right 
to uh, or less perfection. No to the constant desire for still more or still better. Uh, this, uh, after years of uh, uh, which are dominated by order, we are going to see years dominated by control disorder. It's so much better to have something which is natural, authentic, nice, warm, even if it's not totally perfect. At Mirabal, we say we prefer deep comfort to artificial luxury. Obviously, nature and sustainability uh, goes with this definition of authenticity. Uh, consumer want to connect with nature, with local culture, and with the environment. Less what about me, more socially, socially conscious. That's another evolution which leads to a new one. Uh, cultural hybridization, we talked about it briefly. Uh, we are at the age where civilizations are colliding. Uh, colliding in a positive sense and where uh, bits and pieces of different cultures are reassembled to new cultures, whether it is in Europe, in the US, uh, North America, but also Latin America. Uh, in terms of tourism, new destination will be ideas and concepts as much as they are physical destinations. And those new destinations obviously include destination spas which share of market regarding tourist destination is going to grow tremendously in the next few years. Uh, togetherness. Uh, people like being together uh, all times, but in a, in a very different way. Uh, today, um, people, and tomorrow, people will want uh, more emotion, more doing things together, not only having fun together, doing things together, uh, giving and receiving, and taking part in things. Uh, this is what I call togetherness. So people, we'll come back to that later, and it's not a contradiction, are more individualist than they have ever been, more about themselves. And at the same time, they want to be together more than they have ever been. Personal growth. Obviously now, consumers expect to achieve a level of fulfillment when uh, they go on vacation that carries forward into everyday's life. And that's what a number of us here in this room are uh, trying to do. Uh, wellness, well-being, discovery, uh, learning, uh, uh, mindfulness. Also, mental recuperation. Years ago, when we were going on vacation, we were tired. Our body was tired because we were too long, whatever. Today, the issue is not fatigue of your body, but it's stress. And stress is, obviously, we all know that, very different than fatigue. Uh, stress takes everything of you, including your, your uh, intelligence and your creativity. So uh, we are moving again into uh, spending uh, more uh, energy toward uh, stress reduction than we uh, used in the past. Uh, as a summary, uh, away from look at me type wealth, more toward life better lived, away from correcting and more toward preventing, less about owning possessions, more about great experiences. And then the last thing is me. So what in Europe we call ego logic, it's like evolution, what about me? Uh, taking care of myself, healthy living. This, obviously, is something which becomes more and more important. The search for meaning, the quest for spirituality are increasingly important. The search for happiness. And uh, very interesting uh, that uh, it's very recent. Uh, three weeks ago, David Cameron, uh, the new Prime Minister of the UK, uh, decided that uh, he wants to create a new measure of happiness versus GDP growth. <laughs> That's very interesting. So I'm going to quote him because uh, he changed the word happiness into well-being, which also, by the way, is uh, interesting. I'm quoting him. It's time we admitted that there is more to life than money and that it's time we focus not just on GDP but on GW global well-being. 
interesting that he has substituted happy with well being, I say. So much that David Cameron is trying to get the concept up and running at a time where the UK is going through the most drastic budget cuts they had since Margaret Thatcher. Interesting that they do it at a time where the living costs are soaring in, uh, in the UK. Recently, he added another thing. Well-being cannot be measured by money or traded in markets. It's about the beauty of our surroundings, the quality of our culture, and above all, the strength of our relationship. Improving our society's sense of well-being is, I believe, the central political challenge of our times. Very interesting. So, happiness. The search for time, obviously we all are looking for time and uh, quality time. Quest for concrete dreams, no longer enjoy, but be. Uh, people want to rediscover themselves, but at the same time rediscover others. And the quest for health, uh, obviously, uh, living more healthy. So it leads us to wellness, which is going to be, now that we have a global perspective, so let's go into uh, wellness. Combining personal growth, which we just talked about, and healthy living is wellness. But Susie Ellis has a better definition of wellness, so I'm going to quote her. <laughs> Those things that enhance quality of life, improve health, and bring a person to a high level of well-being. Pampering, she adds, speaks to the goal of most pagoas of stress reduction and relaxation, and that in itself is preventive. <coughs> so, let's talk about prevention for a short moment. Prevention has moved front and center in the health uh, field, obviously. And the spa industry, I would like to re-emphasize what Deborah said, and the spa uh, industry's role in prevention-focused health should be greatly emphasized. For years, spas have been doing prevention, focusing on exercise, nutrition, stress reduction, and a number of other things, including uh, Eastern stay well uh, medical paradigm, like traditional uh, Chinese medicine or uh, Ayurveda, among, among others. Uh, and this happened uh, years before those cutting edge hospitals unleashed integrative health centers. Uh, interweaving traditional medicine with many of these established uh, spa approaches. As SRI International says, spa is part of the wellness paradigm where integrated proactive wellness uh, approaches are taken to improving the quality of life as opposed to the conventional medically oriented reactive approach that is taken to solve problems and is more of a treatment paradigm. This is what led us at Miraval to the creation of the Andy Wild Wellness Center, which we are very proud of. We believe that health is just not the absence of disease, but rather a sense of wholeness and balance that creates an inner resilience uh, and balance, I'm sorry, uh, resilience to meet demands of living without being overwhelmed. And this is, uh, I come back to that, what I personally have learned at Miraba. And I would like to just a little uh, personal comment. Uh, in my career, uh, by pure accident, I had to turn around uh, companies uh, on two occasions, major turnaround. And it's the first time I have a job where I don't have to turn anything around because Miraba is doing very well, but Miraba turned me around, really changed me. So, uh, I, you know, I, I would like to, to, to emphasize that. I wish, I say, uh, I wish I'd known Miraval when I was 30 years old. That would be a good deal, but never too late, right? So, um, the wellness center, uh, the wellness program allows guests to interact with uh, the world around them in a, in, a, in, a, in a better way when they go back home. Uh, as a result of living this way, uh, optimum health also brings uh, with it, a sense of strength, joy, and confidence. <coughs> Wellness, as it relates to health, is a series of strategies 
uh, which should be uh, personalized, uh, very specific to each individual, that allow optimum health to be achieved. An important initial step is, uh, for those strategies is we think that the individual should decide what is his own definition of health. It comes back to the same as the marketing issue is. Today, we are in charge of our, of our own thing. So what is my personal definition of health? And this is what Mirabal helps you answer. Uh, and we provide an environment uh, outside of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, realities, away from the pace and the pressure of life, which helps you answering this question, as well as a few very important questions, which, by the way, I never asked myself before. Who am I? What is important in my life? What are my core needs? Who are the people that are most important to me? And so on. And, uh, you know, we tend not to ask ourselves those questions and uh, very often not even try to attempt to answer them. Uh, once you answer, it's already a major, major step toward uh, wellness. So once the vision of health is known, uh, not that easy, as I say. The next step involves developing a plan on how to get, uh, how to get there. Oftentimes, it helps to use a coach, uh, which is what we provide, to facilitate the process and guide you uh, through. And the coach may also be a motivator as well as a source of inspiration. And he, may, he, may, he or she may lead you to doing things you are either not comfortable doing or things which you are not even aware of. That's the advantage of using those uh, coaches. We strongly believe that the wellness is going to be the driver of the growth of the spa industry in the future. SRI International estimates that there are already 200, they say I round it to 290 million, they say 289, so plus or minus one, million uh, customers of uh, spa and wellness in the 30 most developed countries in the world. That's a, that's a, that's a significant uh, figure. And uh, growing fast. So it's huge. Why this growth? We at Mirabal see three reasons for this growth. First, the aging uh, baby boomer, my generation, this group of population, is reaching the point where healthcare is their number one concern motivated to stay healthy and maintain, as for as long as you can, a vibrant lifestyle, these boomers will look to other sources of wellness outside the traditional Western model, medicine model. They are open, we, our generation, are, as well as the very young generation, but I've come back to that. The problem is the generation in the middle. <laughs> So we are very open uh, to experiencing all of the options in the alternative and uh, complementary approaches. And as the spa industry continues to expand into this field, so will those people who will follow uh, and visit those spas. Second, the other extreme, Generation Y, the youth people, 25% of the US population, values earth and sustainability, uh, first of all. Uh, but also, remember what we said earlier, this generation is less about <coughs> reason and logic, more about intuition, freedom, and paradox. In addition, and obviously as a consequence, they are very um, electronically savvy, and they like personal attention. Egology is very clear for this youth generation, me, myself. It's not selfish, by the way. It's, it's just taking care of myself, but I'm part of the group. They are the result or the driver for the change from this consumer society into the information society. And this would be an entirely new subject, but what we are witnessing today in Tunisia, in Egypt, and in Libya is linked to this. This youth, by the way, look at who is in the street in Berlin. They are this generation. Not, not the middle-aged population. So, uh, and those, uh, these youth are used to uh, healthcare, uh, obviously, uh, they are used to wellness, and uh, because it's part of some freedom, they are much more open 
and, 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 uh, and, and less stubborn about uh, trying different things. Last, uh, they have been, they, they were born with stress. I, I hate to say that, but they know what stress is. We learn stress over time, my generation. They have been stressed from the time they started working or they were at school. So for them, a massage anti-stress is part of their daily routine, if you want, which was not our case. I remember uh, the first time we talked uh, in, in a previous company I was the CEO of, we talked about uh, putting a number of spas there. And the reaction of the people, well, well uh, why massage? I'm not sick. Yeah. So uh, the youth generation uh, doesn't have this, uh, this uh, feeling. Very interesting. And, uh, a manicure or pedicure for them is as regular part of their care routine as uh, brushing your teeth for, for all of us. So, uh, huge potential in this, with this generation. And the third reason wellness is going to drive the spa market are women. First, feminization of society, we say, remember, uh, evolution, but also women have always been better than men, men in prevention, in taking care of themselves, clearly. Men are more about uh, managing a crisis when they when they get sick. So uh, more and more uh, women uh, partners or wives uh, are going to push their, their uh, other half into uh, more prevention. And uh, because women are the first driver of uh, destination spa occupancy, obviously it's going to help driving the market. So back to Miraval and then I'll conclude. I'm sorry I've been a little long. Too long? No, it's okay. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, we think, I mean, well, obviously, that we are the uh, ideal place, place for uh, wellness to occur. Everything about uh, our place uh, speaks uh, to the notion of becoming more mindful and more self-aware from the uh, mountains. Uh, Bernie mentioned I bought a house. Uh, that, that's the best acquisition I ever did. I, I have this house uh, uh, you know, at the foothills of the Catalina Mountains, and, and uh, only this is appeasing. I mean, just watching the mountains and the painted skies uh, of Arizona is uh, it, extremely uh, in inspiring. So that's, uh, that's the place. From the artwork on the walls and throughout the ground we have at Miraval to the music of native, dr native drums and, um, and flute uh, to the mingling of bird songs. By the way, again, I cannot resist telling personal stories, but I spent in those mountains three days with uh, a guy we have with an American Indian, uh, Tony Headhouse, and uh, he, explained me, he explained me the importance of the ground uh, for his ancestors and why those grounds were peculiar, were, were not like any ground. And if the Indians came here, there were specific reasons which were practical but also very spiritual. So, uh, uh, by the way, those, those the three days were absolutely uh, fascinating, not totally comfortable but fascinating. So that's what uh, we have at Miraval, uh, all the way to this uh, fantastic bed uh, we have. Uh, I was uh, talking with one of our guests the other day. He said, well, it's like bubble gum. <laughs> it's, truly a, it's truly a good bed. And last, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, the, place, the place itself, the, the ground, uh, has an energy that invites deep reflection and transformation. Uh, all of the experiences we uh, create at Miraval, and I would like to salute here a person who couldn't come today, uh, and I'm very sad for that, it's Michael Tompkins, who is the president of Miraval Arizona. Uh, we were very closely as a team. Uh, he's been, uh, frankly, the inspiration and the renewal, uh, the, the renewal of Miraval, finding uh, all those new ideas and evolving Miraval into this uh, wellness, and, and I would like to uh, salute uh, the, the work and creativity of uh, Michael here. Um, we will continue to expand uh, quality complementary approaches to health that are cutting edge again. Uh, this is where uh, Michael is of, uh, uh, you know, uh, has a great, great uh, spirit. Uh, now, the last thing I would like to mention is that uh, beyond the, uh, the programs, uh, acupuncture, massage, behavioral uh, health, nutritional counseling, nursing services, uh, sexuality uh, counseling, sleep enhancement, and many others. The important is that you can combine whatever treatment or activity you want and it's going to apply to your whole person. Uh, and because Miraval is about choice, you select what you do uh, yourself. 
uh, without influence, you, you move through the Mirabal experience as you wish uh, for whatever specific needs you have at the time of your stay. Uh, again, we, that's why we like this notion of freedom, which we think is going to become more and more important. We, we think that the time where people are told what to do are uh, gone or on the way uh, to go. And last, my conclusion, I read an interview of the uh, Surgeon General of the United States uh, recently, uh, Dr. Benjamin, and uh, I wanted to uh, quote her uh, two answers she gave to, uh, which I, I really uh, liked. Uh, she gave to the uh, uh, New, York, uh, uh, New York Times interviewer. Question. When you were nominated for Surgeon General, your critics tried to disqualify you on the basis of your weight, saying you were perpetuating rather than battling it. By the way, that's a tough question. Answer. My thought is that people should be healthy and be fit at whatever size they are. Uh, really, uh, I, that, I, I admire the answer. So true. Second question, what sort of exercise do you recommend for people who don't love it? I want exercise to be fun. Don't want it to be work. I don't want it to be so routine that you are bored with it. We used to jump rope a lot and double dutch and went to a disco to have fun and enjoy ourselves. We did not go to the disco because somebody said, go dance for 30 minutes. <laughs> Maybe we need to dance as a nation. I would say that for France also. But yes, I love to dance. And whenever I am at events and places with music, I will dance. That exercise is medicine, and it is better than pills. It cannot be said in a better way. And I think it reflects so much our philosophy at Miraval. I cannot agree more. And I also love dancing. So I'll try to dance with her next time we have it together in an event. Thank you for your attention. Before we let Philippe go, uh, questions, because uh, he has had a problem, uh, some corporate event this afternoon that he has to leave us before the uh, end of the day. But anybody got any quick questions for him before we continue? because there's, there's a, a gentleman in the back who uh, has uh, introduced himself to me from the Rotary Club of Washington and also a native a member of a Native American tribe. Question? My name is John Dan. I'm a Choctaw of Oklahoma and uh, local tribes. We're looking at developing uh, Choctaw Indian Health Services for the future. Native American. Spas. Well, I think Native Americans were wellness. <laughs> That's what, yes. And so uh, I think it's a good idea. If we can help you in any way, it would be a pleasure. Thank you. Due, due to our tight program, I just want to tell you that uh, thanks to uh, our, the Revolution Company here in Washington, we are videotaping uh, this morning's presentations. It will be streamed on the website of the Spa Alliance and uh, published in uh, Spa Management Magazine. So anything that you didn't jot down this morning, we will have it for you. Thank you, Philippe. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn the podium back to our symposium chair, Mary Bemis. behind and I'm going to delve right into the next session which is the future of integrative medicine. We have Dr. Pam Peek here who is the owner of Peak Performance. I'm not going to waste time introducing people. And she is joined by Susie Ellis, the president of Spa Finder and board member of Global Spa. And we have Brian Thiel, formerly of the Samueli Institute and a government relations expert. I would please welcome you to come up and take your seat. Start the session.
As a physician and a scientist, I'm here to save your life. Everyone out of their seats now. There's something I want you to Google when you get home, and it's a new disease. It's called sitting disease. You laugh. It's the real deal. Dr. James Levine at the Mayo Clinic has made this very apparent over the last five to six years in his work. And it's exceptionally important that you don't sit on your little behinds longer than 60 minutes. I like to get up roughly every 20 to 30, and I highly recommend fidgeting. All right, now. Stretch, go ahead. You know how to stretch, up you go. Everybody stretch. Here for the pod, just for you know exactly what you're doing, right? <laughs> By doing this, you're allowing yourself to have optimal homeostasis, and it only takes about a minute, two minutes to do this. You never sit more than about 30 minutes or so. All right? Sit, I just say it for a The reason this was really important, quite frankly, is because it's the real deal. If you sit longer than 23 hours accumulative without moving over the course of five days, if you're a man, your risk for coronary vascular disease increases by 64%. Now, you notice I said sitting without moving, all right? So we're doing the glacier thing in front of your video screen or whatever. If you, however, break it up many times, then you neutralize this entirely. And for all of you who thought that one hour you just knocked off in the gym in the morning on the elliptical, kind of mitigated, forget it, it doesn't work. Even if you did that hour at any point in time of the day, but sat the rest of the day, you're still in the same position. So keep in mind that human beings were meant for moving. Why did I bring up all of this in the first place? To give you an example of how far we've come. Pretty cool stuff. We would never have talked about this. I'm a physician and a scientist. And 20 years ago, we would have been laughed out of the halls, as Dean Ornish was 20 years ago, as many of us were. But, you know, Philippe talked about what was going on 40 years ago. I'm going to flash back 20, because it occurs to me that 20 years ago was precisely when Senator Harkin had placed into the NIH um, budget bill uh, the establishment of the Office of Alternative Medicine it was exactly 20 years ago. Most people didn't realize that. And as such, I was thinking about what's been going on over the past 20 years as we look at integrative medicine. I'm going to lay down the framework and the foundation before we begin the panel so you understand now where we are and some possibilities here as well. I just came back from a week with the Surgeon General. Um, I, we were back in California at the Culinary Institute of America's Harvard course where we teach 400 physicians with a waiting list of 400 how to cook and how to cook healthfully. Is that innovative? That's pretty cool. It took them a number of years to be able to establish this as a, as a full continuing medical education course, but there it is. And interestingly enough, the person who heads up the course is Dr. David Eisenberg from Harvard. And David, if you remember, was the very famous scientist um, and physician who published many years ago, 20 years ago, that famous um, uh, study of Americans and their spending in complementary medicine, finding out that it was a multi-billion dollar business that was almost all cash out of pocket. Who knew? until he finally put those stats together. And then began a long journey. A journey was interesting because I was basically a, uh, a straightforward scientist 
a molecular biologist and a uh, stress physiologist in my laboratory at the National Institutes of Health when I got a wild and crazy phone call one day, which occurs very infrequently in the laboratory. And it was from Kim Marshall from the International Spa Association who headed up the PR and communications. And she said, hello, I represent the International Spa Association. I said, say what? You know, what is that? You know, I was pale white. I'd never had a massage in my life. And all I knew how to do was accrue more degrees. Um, and there it was. And she said, would you like to come out to a meeting? And, and would you explain what this new complementary alternative medicine thing is about? The reason why she called me was because of sheer serendipity. I was sitting on a panel at the National Institutes of Health one day talking about stress, and the guy sitting next to me said, well, are you interested in doing some fun stuff across campus? And I said, well, what are you up to? Who are you? His name is Dr. Joseph Jacobs, and he was the first director of the Office of Alternative Medicine. And I said, wow, alternative medicine, what's that about? He said, meditation, and massage, and shark cartilage, and bee pollen, and I, and of course, with three degrees from Berkeley, I said, yeah, man, let's do it. <laughs> Bring it on. So, of course, I went off and uh, I did a Jekyll Hyde thing for quite some time. By day, she was in her white coat and scrubs and doing my stuff. And by night, I took it all off and I ran across campus. And I had the most extraordinary journey. And that journey uh, took me to amazing places that allowed me to be able to feel for what was going on in this field. Herb Benson at the Harvard Mind Body Institute, his first and futile attempt to teach me meditation. It was ugly. You know, I sat there and I thought I was supposed to hit Nirvana the first time. You know, I didn't know. What do I know? And, uh, and it was actually very disturbing. It's like, wow, I have to go deep and I have to do this and that and phew, mind expanding. So as Philippe has been opening his mind and going through amazing experiences. So also did I. What an adventure that was. And then we came to the issue of research and studies and, and credibility. Above the clinical director's office in the main building of the National Institutes of Health is a sign. It says, in God we trust. Right below it it said, Everyone else must show data. <laughs> that meant you give me some solid stats and we'll start a conversation. So when I was approached by the spa industry to begin to try to make sense of what this was all about, I quickly ran over the National Library of Medicine. They didn't even have any spa modalities in the vocabulary at the library. It was that early. Massage wasn't there. None of this was here. And most of the studies were European and Asian and Russian. And a lot of it could not be deciphered very well. So we were in the very, very early stages of understanding how we can accumulate some data and understand what was really going on in mind-body science as it existed at that time. So we slugged it out. Politically, it was a wild and crazy time. You're associated with what office? The office of what? The alternative medicine, what's that about? Well, let's start with the mind. Could it be that Tai Chi might, pe might help people with cerebral palsy? What I did was I decided to look in the vaults of the National Institutes of Health, where they have all of the current ongoing research in each of the 17 institutes. And I started with the National Institute of Mental Health. I figured, you know, there's got to be some, some meat here. And sure to form, there it was. Hidden in there were no less than 40 studies that were ongoing that were incredibly sexy. Again, to the Tai Chi, to the martial arts, to the effect of meditation on high blood pressure. A lot of the beautiful work that's been funded at, at Harvard, in the Harvard Mind Body Institute. Nobody knew because nobody wanted to talk about it. It was kind of covert operations until we began to bring it out, bring it to the fore. And then suddenly we had a little bit of money to be able to fund some pilot projects. We call it a homeopathic budget. It was about $5 million, and that's all we had. 
which is a big joke. Of course, it's much bigger now. And so we used that and we began to pull together a network of research centers across the United States that were brave enough to step forward and to set up a center of integrative medicine study. And now we have them at almost every single university. Interesting things began to happen, however. Many of these centers eventually became integrated into the traditional center. So if you were to go to Sloan Kettering right now, and if you were to receive oncology services, cancer services, it is standard operating procedure now to have massage and to have someone coach you with meditation. Who knew? This is wild. And yet it took us quite some time to be able to get to this point. While I was in California, my alma mater is Berkeley, as I mentioned. I decided to take the Surgeon General over and to play a little bit at my alma mater. And one of the first things I did was I called up Alice Waters. I actually was one of the very first people to ever eat at Chez Panisse. I lived close by as a graduate student. That was when the entrees were about $15. How well I remember. And I followed her and, and have been such an admirer for many years. And I said, how about I get back to you? How would you like a sitting Surgeon General to walk through your famous organic garden at Martin Luther King Middle School and to play with the children and allow them to show her how to grow asparagus, how to cook it in their own little kitchen, and then to set out a plate for her to eat. They did it all. What does research now show? That if you cook, that if you grow vegetables, and this was pertinent to children, when children grow their own vegetables, they eat them. And it's an interesting thing to watch. So I told her this ahead of time. I always like the primer. And as we walked in there, we had children walking up saying, this is my asparagus. <laughs> I'm going to eat it. It tastes wonderful. Here's a lemon I grew. Hold on to it. It took a long time to grow. See the value added? You grew it. There was a sense of pride. And to watch that whole thing come, I watched Alice basically move to tears to be recognized by the U.S. Surgeon General for her work. Finally, we've gotten to a point where we're hearing these kinds of messages, that this is that important. When you look at uh, the credibility issue, there are a number of tipping points that Susie and, and Brian are, and I are going to be talking about. What were the tipping points in all of this as we slugged it out in the beginning trying to get people to listen what was going on while I was in the office? The vice president at the time was Al Gore in the beginning. We got a phone call from his office saying that Mr. Gore's mother was having a series of strokes, you might remember, and she was having difficulty doing rehabilitation. Could there, perchance, be anything that you could re recommend from your office that might be able to help her? Acupuncture. So next thing you knew, we had her undergo acupuncture, and son of a gun, it helped improve her. What do you say we had a fan in the gores? That helped, because then the word gets out. And then piece by piece, people begin to open up their minds, saying, well, gosh, there must be something to it. Today in Washington, if you haven't had acupuncture, you're a loser. <laughs> because everyone now is getting to a point where we're open to experiencing and understanding this. Why? University of Maryland studies on acupuncture in pregnancy-related vomiting and in lumbar pain are so compelling. And these have been repeated and very, very credible. We now understand, and many orthopedists now today, openly recommend acupuncture for the relief of pain from lumbar um, strains and related illnesses. So look how long this has taken. Over the course of the last 20 years, the tipping points, 
The first one I mentioned was science because science is so huge. Um, we started coming up with words like wellness. It's interesting, I was talking to Deborah earlier. There's a book you should buy. It's called The Longevity Revolution. It just came out earlier this month. You've probably seen it written up in multiple um, media sources. The Longevity Revolution by Friedson and Martin. And in this, um, they took 2,000 children that were discovered in my state, California, in public schools all throughout the state who appeared to be fun and promising, kind of neat kids in grammar school. And they followed them for 80 years. Now, the original psychologist was long past gone, and Fritz and Martin took over. And what they found was the following. What they found was that a lot of what you thought, you know, when we look at good science and back and forth, what we thought was, was going to be an absolute determinant for longevity, it really wasn't. Do you have to be happy-wappy? No. What you have to be are the following. Conscientious, mindful, where'd that word come from? Could it be from spa, perhaps? Vigilant. And it was perfectly fine to worry a little bit. Just don't make a second career out of it. Okay? And what did that mean? It means you were aware of your surroundings. That you embraced them. That you were absolutely in touch with those social relationships that Philippe talked about so eloquently. So what was happening here was, wow, this was amazing. They looked at the people who were most successful in their longevity, not in terms of just numbers, in terms of quality. And that was one of the first things they found. So that was exceptionally important. That study also showed that there's no simple template for living well. You find your own path. It works for you so long as self-destruction is not a piece of the action. Very interesting. So there's a lot of variability here. There's another great piece. And this is the marvelous work that has now come out over the course of the last 20 years from Tom Curls at Harvard with the, cent with the centenarian studies, as well as David Snowden studying the nuns of the Notre Dame, most of whom go on to be 100 years old. Seems to be a, a trend in women who never marry. <laughs> Just the thought, well, it's true. The data speaks for itself. It's a little rough. And also in the longevity revolution, marriage works better for men than it does for women. It's an interesting thing. You just have to have a happy one to find it your way. So when you looked at what it took to live long and live well with the centenarian study, what we found was that Again, the grand majority of these people had a mental attitude that was extraordinary. When they were asked across the board, would they ever have ever dreamed that they'd be 100 years old, their response was almost uniformly the same. I never thought I would. They never stressed over it. They weren't neurotic. I'm 99, am I going to make it? You know, they weren't running around. They were relaxed, vigilant, conscientious, prudent, and mindful. Seems to work. A lot of the same, a lot of the same words we use in, in our own spa language. And finally, this this issue of wellness. I was talking to Susie a little bit earlier, and we'll revisit this. They said something interesting in this in this uh, book, which I really think that we need to think about. Wellness. Where did that word come from? It's fairly new. I'm the chief medical correspondent for Discovery Health Television as well, and I remember talking to Eileen O'Neill, who at that time was my boss, the head of the channel, and she said, should we do a wellness show? What is wellness? It's like wrapping your arms around fog. It's just, what is it? She says, I'm afraid. And I said, you should be. Because, you know, it's very difficult to try to come up with, wow, that's obviously a wellness show. What does that mean? So they did two shows and they both won. 
because number one, I think the timing was off, but then number two was, what is this thing, Will? Well, in the longevity revolution, they said something that I can't forget. They said, why do we have wellness? Years ago, wellness came from the people we knew who were our mentors in life. It was like life 101, having a little difficulty with self-care or whatever. Go to grandma, go to your aunt, go to the wise people in your, in your community. You know, you had a whole network of these people. They're not there anymore. Also, the self-care issues become much more complex. We have iPads, we have i-everything, and we stare at this, and what does this do to us? Sitting disease, you know, other little things. So now we need to have other mentors to help us through this. The spa industry helps us with this in a big way because they give us a lot of this. And then when we look at trends, Philippe, one of the things I, I think is going to be one of the hottest trends, and in working in public policy here also with the Surgeon General, we've, we've noticed that in, in prevention, in a lot of the new prevention council, the prevention um, legislation that's coming down, there are going to be new roles for people to help us with our wellness. They're called wellness coaches. Who knew? You know, Marcus Welby used to be the coach. Madeline Welby. Now we're running out of all the Welbys. Okay? Who's out there to help us? When you leave Mirabel, when you leave Canyon Ranch, when you leave Rancho La Puerta, or anywhere, who then helps augment that experience as you continue your journey when things happen to you in life and back and forth? So, yet another interesting trend. And then finally, although our current longevity appears good, that's great, but that applies primarily to the baby boomers. One out of three people born in the year 2000 will have type 2 diabetes if something doesn't happen. We now have a new word for it. It's called diabesity. And this whole trend is not just because we're eating, you know, mountains of refined sugar and all the rest of it. This comes primarily because we have an obesogenic environment. And that comes from every single sector, including the workplace, which is the second tipping point. So as I'm going to open this marvelous conversation with Susie and Brian, I give you the second tipping point, financial. It's always the, the dollar thing. The work site now, companies are now openly embracing wellness programs, for lack of a better term. Why? Well, when you can save $5,000 per pregnancy at a large company because those women were enrolled in a particular pregnancy uh, optimization program, trust me, they're going to fund wellness worksite programs. And when these numbers started rolling out over the course of the last five, six years, companies now are now taking this and working with this. And, you know, when people spend 90% of their life at work, something had to give. So it all seems to make sense. So the tipping points are science and financial. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us, needless to say. And interestingly enough, as we, as we look at what our real mission here is, I kept thinking back to what Sister Genevieve Kunkel of the famous Notre Dame nuns, the centenarian, said. She's out here in Baltimore, and I befriended her a number of years ago. She's pushing 100 right now. Got her second master's degree when she was 90 years old. Um, she keeps rocking and rolling. And she was used a lot because of her mouth. She just knows how to say it. So on the Today Show, she was asked, what is the secret to your longevity, sister? And she looked up and she says, well, I have but two good traits. I'm alert, and I'm vertical. <laughs> and I thought, isn't that our mission statement too? We just want to do it with a lot of quality. So I am absolutely honored to have Susie 
and Brian here to continue the conversation. One of the things that uh, I was really entranced with, with both um, Susie and Brian, is that they have a beautiful combination of experience. Brian is with the Samueli um, Institute, was, um, and is a government relations um, consultant and expert, and looked at the extraordinary research that is real time that's being done by a private institute that's now headed by one of my former bosses, Dr. Wayne Jonas, um, who had at one time headed up the Office of Complementary Medicine um, at the uh, NIH. And here you have military projects that are ongoing as we speak. And when I went to the Institute, it blew me away to find out that when currently soldiers are wounded in Afghanistan and Iraq, they're now using acupuncture on site to help them with pain relief. Who knew? This is being paid for, and they're finding fantastic results. This is really neat stuff. It's kind of real time, so it's real stuff. Susie Ellis is literally one of the historical milestones and icons in our wonderful industry, um, spanning many, many years, starting with her work with um, Deborah Seke, and now heading up Spa Finders, um, and also becoming a leader, looking at what possibilities do we have out there to be able to combine science and spa, science and spa, and be able to help us understand not only how this benefits our mind and body, but how we can now show credibility that it's not just, as Deborah had said, an industry, that this is a revolution. So as you speak to that, where's that coming from? Thank you, Pam. I haven't heard you speak in a long time. I've forgotten how fantastic you are to listen to. <laughs> Well, as you said, I have been in the industry a long, long, long time. <laughs> Maybe, I don't want to admit how long, but, um, and I go back to Deborah in 1974 when I first started at the Golden Door. And I have lived through a lot of the uh, growth in the spa industry and seeing how medicine and spa have been coming together. And the one thing I wanted to mention is how important the term wellness is to where we are today. Do you have any idea where the word came from, or do you remember just when you heard it? Just give me an idea of like how many years ago did you first hear the term wellness? 1984, anybody else? Five years, 10 years? You know, we did a study, and this is a study that I recommend that you might want to um, um, access. It's free, it's on the Global Spa Summit website. It's Spas in the Global Wellness Market, Synergies and Opportunities, it's 2010. And this study, what it was SRI International that did the study, they asked consumers and the industry separately, when did you first hear the term wellness? And for most people, it's only been five years, maybe 10 years. And then they did an entire, which I think is really an interesting read, the appendices, is all about tracing that term. And the term actually wasn't even around until 1961. And I'm sure at that time it was one book called High Level Wellness that very few people read. In 1977, a gentleman opened the first wellness center in California. And so that was the first time maybe a few people heard the term wellness there. And now you fast forward and now a lot of people, I would say almost everyone, has heard the term wellness. And what I have found is that the, that word has been so important because when you think about the terms integrative health, alternative medicine, complementary, those are complicated words for consumers. And at SpaFinder we deal with consumers a lot. And we've done a lot of surveys. We have 30,000 people a day come to our website and looking for spas or establishments that have to do with wellness. And the consumer gets wellness. Even if they can't define it specifically, like you said, I think it's kind of like getting your arms around fog, but that's okay, because for the consumer, they have an idea 
of what they think of wellness for them. So in my mind, clearly, as you say, tipping points, and Deborah was saying about synchronicity, and I kind of think about your metaphor, Deborah, about these instruments now playing together. I think before the term wellness came around, I think the problem was is that there were things that one group didn't even recognize was a musical instrument, like complementary and alternative modalities. They were doing something over there, but it wasn't even, you know, what is it? Well, now we recognize, and the consumer recognizes, oh, it's another instrument. Maybe we can all play together. So I think it's really exciting that now is the time. It's only been in the last five years, and people in this room are going to be way ahead that spa and medicine and um, are coming together under the umbrella of wellness. And now what I think is important is to look at how do you separate wellness from medicine for the consumer. And we can talk about that later, but um, I just wanted to sort of give some um, importance to the genesis of the term. And I just encourage you to access this uh, study because you'll read it there. It's simple. It's not a very complicated history of the term. And um, it's going to be a big thing because, in a way, it's really the opposite of illness. And Dan Rather did a, um, a um, piece on wellness in 1979. And that was sort of, ta-da, what is wellness? And he even, you can see the piece on YouTube, it's like, where did that word come from? And he, he defined it as the opposite of illness. So, You know, you bring up a really good point. I think a lot of us would agree that in many respects, wellness is how you define it for yourself. You sort of customize it um, in your own way, um, which is really important. Um, when, you're, when you're looking at this, uh, this consumer understanding of wellness, I'm absolutely blown away now by how many people are now saying, where can I go? I, I get this phone call all the time, and half those people who, who are on your website are probably my referrals, constantly saying, go, you know, seek. But what I usually say is when they say, look, here's the deal. I'm tired, I'm beaten up, I'm overwhelmed. If one more person asks one more thing of me, I'm going to hurt them. <laughs> and what I need is I need help. Where do I go? I need to go to a special place, not just somewhere where you're drinking a, you know, a mark. No, I want a different experience. Ah, the wellness travel. The whole issue of meaningful travel. And, and when you go to these spa destinations, what are you really getting? What's the package? What's the promise? What's the hope? I remember the first time I ever went to Miraval many, many years ago when Billy still owned it. And um, it was fascinating. I, when I walked in, I wanted to understand, you know, if everyone in that, as it were, spa community that I came into contact with got the message understood the mission of that particular spa destination. So I walked in, I remember I came in at oh dark hundred, you know, late, woke up in the morning, and I went over to the outdoor little cafe for my coffee and my breakfast. And here comes this marvelous um, attendant. And she came over and she said, well, now what would you like for breakfast and whatever, and I did my thing. And I said, may I ask you a question? What is Mirabelle all about? And what she ended up saying something fascinating. She said it's all about mindfulness. And then she went on to describe mindfulness and wellness like that. This is the person serving me my breakfast. I then went just for grins to almost everyone else from trainers and back and the same thing again and again. That began to be a new opportunity for people to go into a deep immersion in this kind of experience in a big way. Brian, one of the things I see sitting right in front of you is the shield of health. Right. This, the first time I ever saw this, I was kind of blown away. Now, Dr. Wayne Jones was a colonel in the Army, if I remember correctly, um, in addition to being a physician. And uh, so he has a very tight uh, connection with the Army. And I thought, man, how, if, if they can get it, my Lord, you know, could we all get it? I mean, what's that about? I saw the shield of health and I was blown away. Tell us what that's about. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I, I realize that I have to be careful what I put in my bio, because I guess I had expert in there and had made it into the program, so uh, <laughs> I'll do my best, if you will. But, um, 
I am affiliated with the Institute and very uh, glad to do so. And as you mentioned, Wayne Jonas, formerly with, uh, with the NCAM, has been the real um, inspiration for the, for the Institute. And the Institute approaches this year its 10th year anniversary. And for a good share of the early parts of the 10 years, the focus was really on NIH kinds of, kind of a throwback to the NCAM days, uh, studies of what uh, complementary and alternative medicine, uh, what it was all about. And, and Wayne and others really realized that um, we know a lot about complementary and alternative medicine, but we live in a system, we live in a healthcare system that is a curative system. And the curative system is very good if you want to be cured, but if you want wholeness, flourishing, human, human flourishing, resilience, you need more than that. And so while Wayne's uh, perspective and the Institute's perspective since, been, since then has been, has been that. And um, you mentioned affiliation with the military, and it's been a wonderful uh, affiliation. The, the military has been, you might be surprised, but very supportive of uh, funding uh, programs. And the Shield of Health, I'll talk about in a minute, but the, uh, to take care of uh, the service members and more and more of the family and the community. As you may or may not know, or read in the paper, the military personnel, they're broken. They, their dwell time between uh, engagements is very short. They uh, were in two, maybe two and a half wars, and, um, and this has been going on for longer than Vietnam, I guess longer than any war. And so, um, Individuals, uh, warriors come back and um, they're heavily, often heavily dependent on drugs for pain. They are, uh, have social issues and uh, they need to be reintegrated back into their communities and into their families. And so, and Yes, yes, there is a Q&A afterwards. Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, and Wayne, in the relationship with uh, the military, we've, we've been able to um, attract the interest of the highest levels of the, the military. And Admiral Mike Mullen and his, particularly his wife, Deborah, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, is a great advocate for what he calls total force fitness. And I brought with me uh, the August supplement last year to uh, military medicine. Now, military medicine is published by the American Society of Military Surgeons, very curative, you know, established mainstream medicine. And yet this is a supplement that the Institute uh, prepared that uh, has the shield of health. And included in the health, shield of health is medical. We well, to say that, but there are also many things that are very important to this community, social, physical, environmental, spiritual, nutritional, psychological, and behavioral. And from the standpoint, and Admiral Mullen wrote, wrote a um, uh, preface to this. And it's tremendously supportive, and we understand is getting ready to put out guidance, which is very military, guidance on the integration of the total force fitness. But it's a recognition that wholeness flourishing, resilience, um, and the health of, a, of the future of the military is more than just medical. It's, it is uh, everything, uh, many other things. Let me one divergence, if you will. In the course of working with the Institute, too, we've had the opportunity to interact with Congress with regard to, um, with regard to the National Health Reform Act, the Affordable Care Act. And um, in there, there is a provision that I think is very important, and that is uh, the non-discrimination clause, which allows providers, which would include chiropractic, uh, massage therapists, and all the devil's in the details, and the details really will be developed by HHS, but, but allows the, the uh, within the federal plans to be, to, to operate within the scope of the practice. I think that's very important for, you know, those that are uh, within integrative medicine and trying to integrate within mainstream medicine. I think that's huge, and that's something that every single person in this room needs to understand. And that is, um, on Capitol Hill, because of the um, Affordable uh, Care Act and, um, uh, the uh, overall health care reform push, what we now have is we have recognition for the first time, I remember telling you this, Deborah, um, recognition of these other modalities 
never been recognized before, weren't even acknowledged at all. Now it's important to understand that not only are they being recognized, but they're being included in policy decisions as well as plans, praise God, um, for reimbursement at some point so that when we set up these new networks, um, these what we call the medical homes now, which are going to be decentralized medical units all across the United States with uh, multi-specialties, that we will include people as part of that team who will be able to give us integrative holistic therapies, very much like what I described with uh, uh, Sloan Kettering. So I think that that is very, very big. My goodness, that just happened 12 months ago. So that's how fresh this information is. And the very fact that the military has embraced this is huge. It's absolutely huge. I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples. There's a pain clinic out in Hawaii. Uh, who has pain in Hawaii, I guess. But the pain clinic in Hawaii that serves the military and their families. And they include relaxation for PTSD, primary and pain. They include relaxation therapy, chiropractic, massage therapy, and a whole array. Today, for PTSD at Walter Reed, uh, you'll likely be exposed to have acupuncture and, and um, acupuncture and relaxation therapy and yoga nidra. So. Yeah, and yoga now there. has become a big thing. I mean, it's now it's it's no longer you know some misunderstood cultish strange experience. Um, now it's uh, of course been embraced by sports teams. Um, needless to say, it's integrated into schools now. And there's a book you should buy that will be coming out June 1st. It's written by one of my colleagues, and it's called Transcendence. And it's written by Dr. Norman Rosenthal, who is the, uh, uh, the founder, or I guess the father of seasonal affective disorder. And it's, um, this is hardcore, and you as spa people absolutely must have this kind of information. It is literally a compendium of science showing the relationship between meditation and everything from uh, uh, the treatment of ADD to substance abuse um, to anxiety and depression, etc. cetera. Uh, it's basically um, medicating with meditation instead of pills, as it were. So Mary Elizabeth has opened up the uh, the table to Q, no to Q and A, and I think that that's going to be very important because I'm looking at the time, and I want to make sure that everyone here has an opportunity to be able to ask Brian and Susie as many questions um, as you wish um, while we have them up here uh, on the panel. So Susie, go right ahead. Very quickly, and I'm happy to talk about it now because the project's underway, and uh, it is very exciting. I think it's going to be a game changer. It's going to be available May 15th. And, um, you know, I'm part of the Global Spa Summit. These are um, executives that come together once a year. Um, Philippe was with us last year in Istanbul, and Deborah's been with us. And um, we get together and talk about what would be good for our industry as a whole. We take our competitive hats off, and it's like just what would be good. And Ken Pelletier, Dr. Pelletier, who I know you know, challenged us last year saying that we are just really too conservative about the value that we bring um, because the research is there. And here's what we're doing. Because, you know, you talk about the studies that back things up. And then I ask, well, where are the studies? How can you get to the studies? And it seems like, oh my gosh, it's very complicated. Well, we have now, we're in the process of putting together what's called a evidence-based medicine portal for spa and wellness modalities. And what it is, we're going to start with 21 modalities, like massage, like meditation, music therapy, things that we've curated. Dr. Pelletier and Dr. Daniel Friedland have been working with us on this. You'll go to that page, you'll click on, med on meditation, and it will bring you to four databases. We've selected these databases. Um, one of them is Natural Standard. One of them is NCCM, or NCAM rather, Cochrane, and PubMed. They may not mean anything to you now, but we're making it very simple because we will actually link you directly to curated studies from each of these databases. And so it'll be very simple, you'll be introduced, and then once you do this, you'll find you can do it on your own. 
And the exciting thing is that these databases are just really, again, available because of technology and fairly recent. You probably know more than I would, but this couldn't have been done before the internet and before the databases have been aggregated. And these are aggregated globally. So we do have the studies from Russia and Hungary, et cetera. There'll also be a place for people to contribute ideas, uh, studies um, that they might know about. And it's a start, and I think it's going to be totally transparent. It's going to be free. That's what we want to do. That's why these studies are free. We want the information to be available to as many people as possible so we can really start talking about the reality in our industry, what works, what may not have a lot of research to it, what really isn't working so well, and so we can have a conversation about it, and it's transparent. And you know, the consumer, as we know, the consumer is quite willing to try some things that maybe haven't had all the double-blind studies done, but they are willing to try it, but we can be transparent and say, this modality doesn't have quite as much research behind it, maybe we can actually encourage it. So that's one of the exciting projects. The other one is a white paper we're working on um, called Wellness and Medical Tourism, Where Do Spas Fit? Very important that all around the world, governments are talking about um, funding. They have talked about funding medical tourism, which is crossing borders for medical reasons, surgeries and um, you know things that are procedural, dental, and so on. But what's new now, and as you know, because the word is new, is wellness tourism. And wellness tourism is already a larger piece of the pie than medical tourism is. And wellness tourism is something the spas should be excited about because that's where we fall. And one of the things that changed my mind from a couple years ago, I used to think medical and spa should come together and hold hands and, you know, be one. And now I don't feel that strongly about that because medical has a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, a lot of, you know, um, parameters, rightfully so, has to. And spas, we've been more entrepreneurial, we have tried different things, we have a different uh, standard, and I think they work beautifully as together, not together this way, but separate and yet um, encouraging each other, where the wellness and the spa, at times you'll refer to medical, and medicine and doctors are seeing the value of having their patients also do prevention and some of the things we offer. So we're seeing in countries, and in this study there'll be 10 case studies, Switzerland is a good example, um, the Philippines, Thailand, where they have medical tourism, wellness tourism, governments are funding quite a bit. That's one of the reasons the Global Spa Summit has been invited to a lot of different countries because they are um, helping fund us coming over to have our meetings because they're so interested in wellness tourism and that's what spas are about. So um, like Philippe said about, which I thought was interesting about his prediction that destination spas would um, really be increasing in interest because they haven't really, you know, been galvanized yet, but I agree they will be, and wellness tourism is going to be part of that. There's one exciting. other piece in talking to Dr. Uh, Martha Honey, um, who you'll be hearing about this afternoon, and is an expert in this field of uh, the uh, wellness tourism, um, and, and something that's very powerful. I was at the White House a week ago, and uh, one of the things that the First Lady and everyone on the Hill now is really using is a very important catch term that we need to embrace as well. And it was really brought home in my conversation with you, Martha. And that is the word sustainable. When we come into you know, a wellness travel experience, are we giving anything back to that environment? Are we affecting that community somehow? Are we going outside? I thought about uh, what Deborah had told me many, many years ago when Rancho La Puerta was first put together. You grew your own food. You were a piece of what that was all about. You became a piece of sustainability. And sustainable communities, sustainable experiences are what this is really all about. That give back, what did you take? Is it become viral? When you, came, when you come back from whatever experience, do you now infect other people with that? It's really kind of an interesting challenge and a comment. And I know we'll be talking a lot more about that in the afternoon. A question.
Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate those comments. Awesome. Well, it's time for us to move on. I want to thank you very much, Brian and Susie, for being part of the panel. And we can continue this conversation at lunchtime and as we mingle during the breaks. But thank you all for coming. <laughs> Running behind, so we're going to have a little change in the program. Chef Chad will be in to give a brief introduction about what we will be having for lunch. Uh, Jennifer Cave from Canyon Ranch Institute, who is in the audience. Where are you, Jennifer? There you are. Would like to come up and speak right now. Uh, she runs a terrific nonprofit that is actually doing some of the best community work I've seen a spa do to date. So please welcome Jennifer Cage. Thank you. This room is full of so much tremendous energy and it's a real honor to be here. Um, I started off in health and health care and working in health insurance. Um, I got into health insurance because I wanted to learn how health care is paid for in our country and I wanted to learn about the health care system. What I found out is we didn't have a health care system. We had a sick care system, which is exactly what all of you have known for much longer than, than I have. That was something I learned in the early 1990s. And from there, I came and uh, lived and worked here in D.C. for about 10 years. I worked uh, at the National Institutes of Health and the Office of the Surgeon General. I'm now, as Mary mentioned, um, executive director for a 501c3 nonprofit public charity. We learned actually is originates from Arlington. So, Bernie. Thank you, thank you, um, and we're delighted to have uh, as our guest chef uh, for our first annual symposium uh, the executive chef at Miraval in Arizona. But uh, we just learned that he's come full circle coming back to his hometown area, that he grew up in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, he, he led a, a very typical Arlington life and knew nothing about nu nutrition or, or spa food. Uh, he worked at uh, some very great resorts uh, that have wonderful spas like en Enchantment and, uh, and uh, uh, came to Miraval about five or six years ago and uh, literally changed his life. I just introduce you to Chef Chad. Thank you, Bernie. And uh, thank you, Mary, for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I see a few familiar faces out there. But uh, for anybody that I haven't met, uh, my name is Chad Luce, and I'm the chef at Miraval, as Bernie said. I've actually been there for not quite three years. Sometimes it feels like it's been five, just because it feels like I came home when I got there. Um, you know, in the Miraval kitchen, it's, um, I think probably our number one goal is to first of all, change people's perception of what, uh, what healthy food is. You know, in, out in the mainstream resort world, I encountered a lot of, a lot of uh, misconceptions when I mentioned spa food, and they seem to make the jump right to overcooked, no color, no salt, no flavor. Um, and so, you know, our goal is to create meals that obviously taste great, um, but also look great, and have the, the added bonus of being good for you as well. Or, you know, in some cases, maybe not as bad for you, depending on what the guest wants, because it is about choice. So, you know, we're not there to be the food police either. Um, we're really committed to helping our guests lead healthier lives by not only providing them with really good, nutritious food uh, that's based on as much seasonality and uh, local or regional ingredients as possible, but also through um, education with our uh, daily cooking demonstrations. We do a couple of uh, dinner demonstrations a week that are very well attended. And you know, I would have to say that the, the cooking demonstrations and lectures are probably some of the most well attended events at Mirabal. They're consistently oversold with the wait list, which is very gratifying for us. And it's always really nice to go out and, uh, you know, and interact with our guests. And, you know, most of our guests are very knowledgeable about food already. Um, some know about cooking, some don't know how to cook, but they know how to eat healthy. 
And so to those people, you know, I always make a point of stressing that, you know, if, if you already know how to cook and you're thinking about making the transition to healthy cooking, it's, there's not that big of a leap to make. You know, the mechanics are pretty much the same. So if you take out the deep fryer, um, you know, you know how to saute, you know how to grill, you know how to poach or braise, anything like that. The mechanics are the same. You know, I came into spa food about about seven years ago uh, with really no idea of um, what it was all about. I learned very quickly, um, and you know, I think for us, it's really about uh, utilizing fresh and sometimes non-traditional ingredients to create familiar textures and flavors as we're reducing fats and sugars and sodium and things like that. Um, and it's it's a challenge that. Uh, that I and all of my staff really enjoy because it's not just about cooking. You actually have to think a little bit about what you're putting into your food. And uh, it's uh, something that causes you to, you know, continue to learn every day, kind of gets you out of your comfort zone a little bit. And uh, that's, that's really, it makes it really enjoyable to come to work. Plus when we see the impact that we're making in people's lives to help them lead better, healthier lives and see the smile on their face when they realize that it's good and it's delicious. Um, that's you know for me that's really a great uh, a great honor to be a part of that. So I'd like to just uh, open it up to any questions before I get back to finish up lunch. <laughs> and by the way, I'd like to uh, thank Susan Delbert and her staff, her culinary staff here. They're doing most of the uh, most of the hard work back in the kitchen. I get this one around in my clean chef coat out here, but. Uh, I go back and yes. Do you miss using cream and butter and things like that? Not really, mm -hmm. not really. You know, I found ways to overcome it, and you know, I mean, there's still a splash of cream or a light touch of butter here and there, so I won't say it's completely gone. But you know, we found ways to substitute that I think uh, give us every bit as much flavor and texture. So yes. Yes, I, at least for myself, I can't speak for everybody in the industry, but uh, you know, my, really for me, my preference is foods that are fairly simple, full of flavor, easy to make, but you know, five or six ingredients, a few steps, um, things that are easy to take home, things that you know, don't intimidate the average home cook into just not making them at all. Absolutely. I hope that's wet your appetite because uh, <laughs> Chef has been working since yesterday with the kitchen crew here at the club. I dare say it's a new experience for them too. And uh, we have to clear the room while the tables are reset. So you get a 10 minute stretch. There are restrooms here on the right, upstairs, and come back in 10 minutes. Thank you, Bernie.